Hi, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of MS Neuro TV by MS Views and News, sponsored by Sanofi Genzyme and Biogen. We're glad that so many of you are, are joining us here today. My name is Anna Fernandez de Castro, and I'm the Assistant Development Coordinator over at MS Views and News. And I'm here today with Jennifer Falk, our Director of Development. Today, MS Nurse Practitioner Megan Weigel will be sharing with us some great and helpful tips on how to access care and resources specifically for multiple sclerosis. Megan is an advanced registered nurse practitioner at Baptist Neurology in Jacksonville Beach, Florida, where she specializes in the care of people living with multiple sclerosis. She was also elected to a three-year term for the International Organization of MS Nurses Board of Directors and also serves on the Clinical Advisory Committee as a research advocate for the North Florida chapter of the National MS Society. So first, we'll begin by playing a 13 minute interview with Megan. Once the video interview has finished, Megan will then be available for a 15 minute Q&A with our audience, followed by a brief survey. We'd also like to thank Sanofi Genzyme and Biogen for making this program possible and for supporting the MS community. All right, let's get started. Welcome to MS Neuro TV, presented by MS Views and News. MS Neuro TV is a comprehensive educational program bringing together MS professionals from across the United States covering the topics that you want to learn more about. To register for MS Neuro TV webinars, visit www.msviewsandnews.org. Thank you. We hope you enjoy the program. Good morning, Megan. Thank you for joining us today. This uh, first round of of questions that I want to ask you have to do with access to care and resources, getting your needs met. And so I want to ask you, um, in your experience, what do you see are common needs that somebody living with multiple sclerosis may have outside of the need for a disease-modifying medication or an MS medication? Well, hey, Stuart. Thanks for having me here today. I'm happy to talk about this. Um, you know, the disease-modifying therapy issue um, and it is probably the biggest one. And so since we're going to skip over that, I'll talk about some other things that uh, people living with MS really have a need for and uh, have a hard time finding because, unfortunately, um, things like social work needs and case management um, are not always offered by even big MS centers. It's hard to retain and pay a social worker um, or a nurse case manager. And, and that's really unfortunate because honestly, that's what every um, neurologist working with people with MS needs. Um, so some of the other needs are things like, um, well, I'm gonna bring the disease modifying therapies into it for a minute because if you have a hard time paying for your medicine, then you probably also have a hard time paying for things like your rent, uh, your heating and air conditioning, um, or maybe you have all those things covered, but when your car breaks down, you're you know, up a creek, so to speak. So. Um, some of the ways that people living with MS can access better financial resources are by using grants for things that they might not know existed. And um, the MS Foundation has wonderful grants for um, uh, technology, for exercise, for home care, um, for uh, things related to, uh, they call it a Brighter Tomorrow grant, and also for cooling equipment. And so accessing financial resources for those things through a grant, if a person qualifies, can be really helpful. 
So you were talking about all these different resources, but do you feel that the people living with MS, the, the actual patients and even the care partners, uh, you think that they are able to access all those resources that might be available to them? Because other than through the MS Society, or the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, do they have a way of knowing about it? Is it made available to them in their clinicians' offices? So one would hope so, um, but oftentimes no. So when I uh, talk to a person about, they say, well, gosh, you know, I, I really, um, I really would like to consider getting um, a, a computer, a new computer or something like that, or, or maybe something that I could, I can't go out to programs, but maybe I could watch Stu, you know, but I, I don't have a, um, I don't have the means to do it. And I usually direct them to the um, MS Foundation website and show them the grants, um, and they don't know they existed. So they're not knowing um, that those things exist outside of being told by someone. Now, in, in that same frame of network, um, the National MS Society has the MS Navigator program. So a person can call the National MS Society um, or their local chapter and be diverted to the MS Navigator program which basically um, is a network of very specially trained case managers. Um, I'm not sure what their uh, degrees are necessarily, but they're specially trained to do case management for people with living people living with MS who have more um, more strategic needs, let's say. Um, but unless you know to call, you don't know that it exists. Um, uh, I would hope that you know, neurologists and MS centers are displaying information for these nonprofit organizations, but they, they aren't always. Correct. So going even a little bit further though with the resources, do the patients know how to access? Do they have resources to find out how to access or direct care? Um, and direct care with, you know, for, for medications, for rehab, for all of that? For medications and information. And information. Um, well, I mean, I can give some of those resources today, if that's okay with you. Um, the MS Navigator program, like I said, is, is available by calling their 1-800 number. Um, MS Foundation, the website is msfocus.org. Um, one can get MRI assistance through the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America, and their website is mymsaa.org. Um, and basically, when you go on those websites, you just click on the links that say patient resources. Um, and the only issue is that if you don't have access to a computer or say you don't have a printer to print out the applications to apply for these programs, um, there are also phone numbers that you can call to talk to an individual about it. I usually try to work through these things with people in my office, like we'll print out the application and there's usually a part for the provider to fill out that says the person has MS. Um, but unless you're accessing things like this and listening to us talk or your healthcare provider is telling you, um, it's probably hard to, you know, surf the internet enough to find where you need to go uh, to apply for these things. That was a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> so. Other, something a little bit different though, now with these same patients, are there, um, the majority of the MS patients, do they feel that they have ways of accessing um, information that concerns bladder issues, cognition, their visual problems, do they know where to go to for these different things, um, sexual dysfunction or depression? If you're talking about information specifically to find out about those conditions, um, they can. I think most people do know where to go. I mean, most people are accessing um, uh, information from the various nonprofit organizations' websites. They're going to MS Views and News, and they're watching your YouTube videos. And I hear that more and more from patients. But as far as um, care access to care for those conditions goes, um, I'm not sure that people always know where to go because they usually go to their neurologist and when their neurologist after say trying a bladder medication wants to refer them to a urologist, um, who wants one more ologist, right? When you're living with MS. Um, so they may bulk at that. Um, but I think that really um, 
for the most part, if you're going to a, a good MSologist, that's the person, and the nurse in that office um, is the person who's directing the avenues for care. In your MS center, is there like a physiatrist, I guess, or, or somebody that actually, other than the, the nurse practitioner, possibly, that can actually sit there and speak with the patient about where they can obtain these different um, resources or, or even to be able to see the different um, other clinicians that are out there concerning these different symptoms or, or side effects that they're getting from um, uh, that while living with the disease? So in my office, unfortunately, we do not have an MS nurse or a caseworker. Um, however, the physicians in my practice and, my and myself spend a lot of time educating patients. So they get their education from us directly. In other practices, um, there may be an MS nurse that sits with the patient and answers questions. Um, sometimes um, uh, LPNs or medical assistants are providing education um, as well, um, but I, I do think that one of the best things that you can tell people living with MS to do is to come to programs in the community because they start to learn from other people living with MS what their resources are. Um, so you may think, well, I don't you know, there's a million dinners every week in every city for every drug, right? For people living with MS to, uh, you know, choose a disease modifying therapy. Well, what if you don't have that type of MS? Or what if you don't want to change your drug? I still encourage people to go because you develop a support network. And what ends up happening is Mary tells Joe that he should think about this kind of splint for his foot drop. And then Joe goes to his doctor and says, hey, doc, why haven't you told me about this kind of splint? So, um, the community is a great place to start. Um, the other thing that I think it's important to mention is many insurance companies also offer case management for people with chronic diseases. Um, they don't necessarily pick you out as having MS and offer it. They're doing it more for people with diabetes and for people with asthma and heart disease because there's more literature in those disease states about the benefits of case management. But I encourage people living with MS to call their insurance company and see if there's a nurse case manager that can help them because those people are often very helpful for navigating the roads with medication denials and um, peer to peers and MRIs and, and helping things move a little bit more smoothly. So we spoke about this though as being part of like the, uh, for people that live in the cities and all the uh, accessibility that is available for them, what do you propose or what can you possibly say to those that are in rural areas of the United States and where they don't get those pharmaceutical programs and where they don't get to see an MS Views and News program or one by the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation or others, but they're really hidden and how can we direct them to find this information? So this information, um, by and large, is available online. So if you have access to internet, you can watch um, your programs on YouTube at the MS Views and News channel. You can go to any of the pharmaceutical company sites um, and watch uh, webcasts or videos. For the most part, you're learning about those drugs, but there's always a little blip about MS in general in the beginning. The National MS Society sponsors um, tele teleconferences or tel telephone programs as well as webinars um, for people and those are the things that they hope touch people in rural places. Um, the MS Association and the MS Foundation do the same things. Um, so they offer these webinars um, and if people don't have computer access you can actually just call in and listen as well. So that's what I would encourage people living in rural areas to do. And thank you for speaking with us tonight, Megan. This was great. I mean, there's so much that I learned from you tonight as well, and I know that the people listening are going to learn as well. You're welcome. So now it's time for all of you in our audience to start typing your questions for Dr. Megan. Please know that your questions remain anonymous, and as I see them coming in, I will relay them to Dr. Megan. 
We will try to get to as many questions as possible in the order that they're received. You can type your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel that you should see at the top right corner of your screen. You should be able to see something that says either question box or type question here. If by chance you don't see that, try clicking on the small orange arrow that should be up in the top right corner of your screen. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Megan. Good evening. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks so much for having me here tonight. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to answering um, everyone's questions to the best of my ability. Great, thank you. Uh, we are having a lot of questions that are coming in from our audience. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you your first question. Um, I have a question here. It says, can you give an example of a patient who you worked with who was able to access community resources that helped them? Sure. Um, you know, that's, that's fairly easy. I have a lot of, of pretty wonderful stories. Um, so one example would be, um, a person who, so, so we live in Florida, um, and um, we had a family who the mother was living with MS and their um, air conditioning broke um, and they were able to apply um, for some financial assistance from the MS Society um, in order to get a, a window unit um, while they were, you know, saving money to, um, to get their air conditioning fixed. Um, other stories that I know um, that I know of uh, on a more global level are specifically for the MRI assistance fund. We have many patients who, even when they are um, that have insurance, the copays are too high to get an MRI. So the copay may be upwards of three, four hundred dollars uh, per scan. Um, and the MS Association of America has the MRI assistance fund. Um, and so even if you have insurance, if you meet income qualifications, then you can um, get an MRI that, that uh, doesn't cost you anything out of pocket. So those are two things that I hear of frequently happening in the community. Yeah, that's great. There, there are a lot of amazing resources out there. Um, we have a lot of questions that continue to come in. Um, how would a homebound MS patient access assistance for depression? Um, so the first thing to do would be to, I would think, um, contact your primary care doctor or your neurologist. And if you, um, if you are unable to get out of the house at all, um, then I would ask for a referral for home health care. Um, if you have Medicare, you must be seen by a health care provider within 60 days of a home health care referral. So that person who's homebound may need to go see their doctor in order to have a referral um, if, if they have Medicare, but many home health care companies have excellent um, mental health programs. So they, they have psychiatric nurses that will come visit with you at home um, and provide um, uh, talk therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and, and then they can also make recommendations to your health care provider to help you get appropriate treatment other than that, if it's needed, that would be the first place that I would start. That's great. I don't think everyone knows that, that, that those services are out there. Thank you. Um, yeah. You know, that's really important. Um, I have another question here. Uh, can you please explain a little more about what case management is and how can it help people with MS? Sure. So case management uh, may be done by a social worker or it may be done by a nurse who has special training in case management. And basically that healthcare professional is looking at your, um, all of your healthcare needs 
um, in in one box instead of just thinking of them, um, say, as, you know, you just need this one thing. They're looking at your whole entire situation, and they're looking at it to see how they can make uh, resources more streamlined for you, um, how they can make your situation easier, um, how they can help you navigate through seeing uh, different specialists and making sure that you have adequate transportation and that you understand what it is your goals are and how you need to be meeting them um, for your healthcare needs. So it's a person who, um, I think of it as a, you know, a director for your um, healthcare schedule. I guess that would be a good way to think about it. That's great. Thank you. Um, our next question, how do you get help for a new wheelchair if you are on Medicare? So if you are on Medicare and you want a new wheelchair, a face-to-face -face evaluation is required with your physician or nurse practitioner. Um, it can be with a primary care physician, it can be with a physiatrist or with your neurologist, but you have to have an appointment whose sole purpose is to discuss your need for a power mobility device. So this wouldn't be a visit that you're just following up for your regular MS care. It has to be a visit specifically um, stating that the person is here to discuss a power mobility device. Um, or uh, a wheelchair, it doesn't have to be an electric wheelchair or a scooter, it may just be a, you know, a, a hand um, wheelchair. Um, and, and then that visit is, um, is sent to a durable medical equipment company and also to um, a, usually a physical therapy or a rehab company that has a seating specialist that's a physical therapist or an occupational therapist and then they evaluate you for the type of mobility device that you need. The whole process is somewhat arduous, and if you don't stay on top of it, um, then it can take upwards of a year, and those face-to-face -face visits with your healthcare provider expire, um, and you may need another one, um, which I find to be pretty funny because it just means that Medicare is putting more money out over time anyway, <laughs> instead of getting that things done quickly. But, um, but even if you have a chair and you require a new one because your assistive needs have changed, you do need to start with that face-to-face -face evaluation. Okay. Yeah, it can be very challenging. And as a follow-up to that question, Megan, uh, are you able to give our audience any information on timing how many wheelchairs are you allowed in a certain time period? Is there any um, ideas on that or any rules on how many wheelchairs you're allowed to have in a certain time period? I'm sure there are, but I unfortunately do not have that information. Um, there, uh, I know for sure that um, with Medicare, you you kind of have to fail each successive type of device to get to the next one. So if you can um, operate a manual wheelchair and you can, you know, push yourself in a manual wheelchair with your arms, they're not going to also pay for you to have a scooter or a power wheelchair. Um, and if you can um, operate a scooter, they're not also going to pay for you to have a power wheelchair. So it kind of goes in that hierarchical order um, of, of need. Um, and that's, okay. that's Medicare. Typically, commercial insurances follow the same rules as Medicare do, or they, they try to. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. I have another question here. Do you think Psychiatric therapy is a priority in recently diagnosed MS patients. So assessing one's mental health status should be a priority in newly diagnosed patients. Um, and more and more it's becoming discussed among um, healthcare professionals, specifically nurses, 
nurse practitioners, PAs, and physicians by mental health professionals um, because of the importance um, of uh, the, you know, the importance of, of taking care of depression and anxiety. I think the incidence of depression and anxiety in MS has been underestimated for many years um, with you know, statistics saying, oh, maybe 40 to 50% of people have depression or anxiety. It's probably more like 70 to 80% of people experience it at some point. Um, the suicide rate in people with MS is also um, several times higher than that in the general population. So um, it is definitely a, um, a priority of assessment um, in both newly diagnosed and and people who've been living with MS for years. Um, psychiatric care is, um, these days is, is hard to find. Um, many uh, mental health practitioners, psychiatrists and psychologists aren't taking insurance, um, Medicare or private insurance anymore. So they're only taking self-pay clients and that, mm -hmm. that's expensive and that's difficult for people living with MS. Um, and getting in to see a psychiatrist or a counselor can take um, several weeks to several months, depending on where you live and what the resources are. So it is a priority, um, and um, I think there's a shortage of mental health providers uh, compared to the number of people both with and without MS that need them. Um, yes. So there's, there's almost like a little crisis there. <laughs> Um, as far as mental health goes in general in our country. Yes, great. Well, I'm, great. I'm glad that we could bring that uh, out tonight, that, that topic. Um, I have another question that just came in. Are there any drugs in the pipeline for primary progressive MS? Um, yeah, there are several drugs in the pipeline for primary progressive MS. Um, it, first of all, the first one was approved for primary progressive MS this year, which is acrolizumab or Acrovis. Um, there is another uh, drug. I know it's not primary progressive MS, but it is secondary progressive MS. So, so there's another uh, drug called um, which is which will hopefully um, be approved for secondary progressive MS um, within the next um, few years. Uh, as far as specific drugs for primary progressive MS, um, I def definitely was not prepared to discuss that this evening. <laughs> Yeah. So um, I don't. I don't think I'd be the the. Uh, I can. I can get back to you on a different webinar. But I did not have um, all of those research trials memorized for tonight. Okay. So I apologize for that. That's okay. Thank you for the information that you gave us. And and we're going to go to our looks like our final question here because we're wrapping up on, on time. Um, Megan, are there any resources out there that you feel are overlooked or not being taken advantage of? Uh, for the MS community? Yeah, you know, I think a couple of resources um, that people with MS may not necessarily know about unless they're going to programs in the community um, that are served by, uh, multi or, or attended by multiple um, nonprofit organizations. Um, but one um, really great uh, organization that can help people with MS is called the United Spinal Association. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that many people know that, that they exist and that they could potentially offer resources to people with MS. Um, another one is the Veterans Association. So um, if you are a veteran, the VA has lots of resources for people um, living with MS. And I would encourage people living with MS to take a look at the MS Coalition website. Um, and that website is, my little thing would work right here. Um, the MS Coalition is a group of 
nonprofit organizations that um, care about people living with MS, and they include organizations like MS Views and News, the International Organization of MS Nurses, the MS Society, the MS Foundation, the MSAA, um, United Spinal, um, the Consortium of MS Centers, Can Do MS, um, and they exist to uh, basic and the Accelerated Cure Project, and they exist to kind of uh, combine resources for people living with MS and make sure everybody knows what's going on um, in the world of, of multiple sclerosis. And their website is ms hyphen, uh, I'm sorry, ms-coalition.org. Um, and you can read about um, the members of the coalition, the calendar of events, which is a great resource because it, it gives hyperlinks to each association's calendars. Um, and uh, the other organization that offers really great programs um, that help persons living with MS, um, basically with lifestyle empowerment, is Can Do Multiple Sclerosis. And their website is www.mscando.org. So those are um, three, uh, organ or I guess four, United Spinal, VA, Can Do MS, and MS Coalition that I don't think all people living with MS are aware of um, as far as um, excellent resources to learn more about staying empowered and staying healthy um, and accessing resources to care when you're living with multiple sclerosis. Well, that is just excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that information with all of us, Megan. We're getting little notes that I wish you could see of people thanking you and thanking us for uh, sharing everything with them. We've got a lot of people on the line tonight, so we're very grateful well, great. for you to participate with us, and thank you so much for that. Um, thank you, Megan. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for thanks for um, having this uh, this program and uh, you know allowing allowing me to be a part of it. Um, I think this is a, a really wonderful way for people to to gain information and um, and ask questions and and learn new things. Yes, definitely, and we look forward to speaking with you again soon for our upcoming webinars. Great, sounds great. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to pass it over to Anna Christina now, who has some closing thoughts and a little bit of final information for the group. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer and Megan. And we'd also like to thank all of you who have joined us here today for our third webinar of MS Neuro TV. Uh, we had over 150 people registered tonight. Um, so we'd really like to thank you all. Um, we'd also really appreciate it if you could please complete a brief survey that will appear um, at the very end of the webinar. Um, your feedback is very important to us so that we can continue to customize our events around our viewers. Please remember that our webinar series will be held every first Tuesday of the month. And for next month's webinar, we'll be welcoming back MS neurologist Dr. Aaron Boster as he goes over how to monitor, understand, and discuss disease progression with your healthcare team. Um, we'll keep you updated this week through email and through Facebook to let you know as soon as registration does open. If you'd like to watch a recording of today's webinar, a video will soon be uploaded on, on our MS Views and News YouTube learning channel. So please don't forget to subscribe and to stay updated. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For more information, please visit us at www msvn.org. And last but not least, we'd also like to give a big thank you to Sanofi Genzyme and Biogen for their ongoing support in making programs like this possible. Thank you all who have joined us here today, and we'll see you all again next month. Bye.